Tell us who you are. Tell us a little bit about you and your iconic That's family. Right. I believe there were seven different rooms. And when they're at war, tell us about what this set it up. The intaglio blocks has which come together you, in my head. Here in Chicago, he's in the collection of the. So that was made what year? Good evening. Welcome. Hi, guys. Welcome to this special evening edition of Meet the Miniaturist. Welcome, folks. If you're just joining, the chat box is open. Say hello. Donald's on the line helping behind the scenes. Thank you, Donald. If, um, if you're new to my live stream, I would love to know. Definitely use the chat box. The chat box will be open throughout uh the live stream so welcome welcome i'm gonna leave i'm gonna um wait another minute while folks are joining it's great to see everybody hi virginia good to see you and susan evelyn we're in your neighborhood evelyn good to see you uh, hi elizabeth cindy's on the line we've got connecticut in the house great to see you hi fran uh, the uh chat box is going fast i can't read it all but great to see everybody um, welcome to this special evening edition of Meet the Miniaturist, uh, gallery edition, and it really is a special night. And before I get to introducing our guests, um, let me go through a couple of things. Um, first and foremost, we are praying for our friends in, in Ukraine. Um, we're just heartbroken by everything that's going on. Please um, support uh, Ukraine any way you can. Uh, so yeah, my heart goes out to them. A couple of things that are going on in the mini world that you should know about. Uh, if you're not planning to go, it's a Tom Bishop show is happening. That is coming up soon, weekend of April 29th. If you don't have your hotels booked, you know, you might get shut out. So, you know, do that quickly. There's also the London Dolls House Festival coming up in May, the 13th and the 14th, and then Dallas, June 24th. So lots of, you know, we're in the show circuit season timing now. So put stuff on your calendar. Um, I've got a couple of live streams coming up, so hold the dates on um, this Sunday, the Office of Collecting and Design. This is a really, really interesting concept, uh, basically all about collecting, including miniatures. We're going to do a, a, a miniature, a Meet the Miniatures live stream this Sunday, so we'll plop the uh, registration in the chat box, so you can go ahead and register and join that Sunday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, you can always catch my my replays of all my Meet the Miniaturist on my YouTube channel. We'll plop that in. Um, and we just had last weekend a really great um, live stream with the contestants from Best in Miniature, which is a reality show based in Canada where contestants are, you know, basically fighting to win the challenge by creating their their um, their most fabulous miniature home, dream home in miniature. So, and then finally. Actually, there's two finalies. The uh, if you don't know who I am, I'm, you know if you're new to my live stream, I would love to like plop that in the chat box. I read every single one of these, so let me know if you're new to my live stream and what brought you here. Uh, but um, you know, in addition to promoting miniatures, every chance I get, I am a passionate miniaturist, but I sell miniatures also, um, and I'm hosting a, a, a webinar this Saturday morning at 10 a.m. Eastern Time about. Um, how to sell your adored collection. So if you have a collection or if you are um, acting on behalf of someone who has a collection and you're looking to sell it, I have a webinar which will explain all of your options for selling a miniatures collection if that's something that you're interested in doing or looking to do, because um, I'm all about finding happy homes for these treasures. And so there is a lot of thinking that has to go into it. So I like to provide as much information as possible about that. So join me on Saturday morning if that's something that interests you. And finally, if you like the content you're seeing, this is there is no charge for this content because I love what I do and sh and sharing miniatures with you. But if you like what you see and you want to contribute to the ongoing development of uh, my programming uh, around the miniatures world, you can join my patrons club. And um, if you contribute to my patrons club, then you get access to exclusive events and um, private activities. Um, that uh, that I like to sort of like thank my patrons with, and I actually had a great uh, a great um, 
uh, guest on last weekend, Anel Ferguson, who uh, was, I know Anel is on tonight, I think. Um, we had a great chat with Anel, part of the private patrons club event. And she's just a maker and author, talented miniaturist and all of the, uh, all of the above. And we had a great chat with her as part of a patrons club event. If you join today, um, I'll go ahead and give you a link so you can see the replay to that. And then finally, the Francis England dollhouse is for sale. Um, I have a blog post about this. You can learn all about this beautiful, beautiful piece that um, I'm helping to sell the owner. Uh, I'm helping to sell uh, for on behalf of the owner. So um, that's basically everything that's going on. Um, so let me bring up our special guest. Um, the we, It's Victor Amarendiz. Amarendiz, I knew I was going to mess that up. Victor from Gallery Victor in Chicago is joining us tonight. Um, and he is joining us from his gallery and we're gonna um, congratulate him. He's, he's got his fifth year anniversary happening right now, which is great. Hi guys. And we're joined by Jay Kupchak himself. So I am just so thrilled to have you guys here today, tonight um, to tell us about your wonderful, wonderful exhibition that's happening right now in your gallery. And then of course we wanna hear from Jay and to talk about some of the wonderful pieces that are in in the gallery right now. So thank you guys for joining. So good to see you. Um, so Victor, why don't we start with you? Tell us a little bit about yourself, about your intro into the gallery world and a little bit about Wonderkammer because really that is the basis for all of this. So tell us what that means and tell us a little bit about the exhibition. Sure. Uh, first of all, Darren, uh, thank you for having us, uh, myself and Jay uh, here and hello to everyone. It looks like you're from all over the world. So this is very exciting. Yes. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I uh, started working in a gallery here in Chicago when I was 27 years old. That's 25 years ago. Uh, for anybody that's been to Chicago and knows the galleries, I worked with uh, Ann Nathan Gallery and had a wonderful gallery uh, here in the city for many years. And I uh, stayed with Ann as her assistant director for 20, 20 years. She retired when she was 92 years old. Um, she announced that in the summer of 2016, my husband and I said, okay, this is the moment we've been yes. sort of mentally planning for. We jumped on our business plan. We closed and down on uh, at the end of 2016 and we opened up three months into 2017 on, on actually today is the day. Today. Third, 2017 was our opening night uh, exhibition. Um, so, um, so that was uh, just a, a really good choice on my part because working <laughs> for yourself is the bomb. Uh, sure. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> And, Tell um, us a little bit about the focus of your gallery and what kind of art you present. And then, of course, tell us about Wonder Camera and how that came about. Sure. The gallery is, uh, our, we're predominantly a painting gallery, mostly figurative art and re realism, but I've really opened that up over the years. So we show a number of abstract, both sculptors and painters as a mix. And um, when I when I left and, and kind of opened my own thing. The, the focus was on the figure and I always wanted to sort of expand that. And that's what I've done over the years. Right. This show is, yeah. you're gonna hear these cuckoo clocks in the background because that's part of our show. I love this it. This show, Wunderkammer, um, has come together in my head for a very long time. Yeah. And trying to figure out the way to um, to make a show like this work really took just exactly the right timing. And I think we found it. So what uh, does that mean? What does Wunderkammer mean? So Wunderkammer is a word that came into popularity. It's a German word around the 1600s. And these were uh, people in, in high society who were trying to establish themselves as mm -hmm. cultured, as worldly, um, mm -hmm. And what they would do is, is amass these collections of objects that showed how connected and how cultured they were. And the objects ranged from um, scientific things, which were being discovered uh, left and right at that time, uh, from different uh, 
paintings, a lot of religious and mystical items were yeah. also very fascinating to the people at that time. And yeah. so think of like a room filled with taxidermy and with scientific discoveries and just exactly what you would imagine that like old world museum to be. Yeah. And these were precursors to museums. These, yeah. these very wealthy collectors then had passed and then they would leave their collections uh, to the public before museums existed and that was the early early uh, and, and so, so talk a little bit about how miniatures fit into that world and how they fit into your exhibition well as the show was coming together in my head we had we had seen uh a number of artist studios the the idea was just really being placed and then uh through a friend, I met Jay oh. and saw the miniature rooms. And what more perfect an addition to this exhibition than the miniature rooms, which are just a total curiosity themselves. Yeah. And beyond yeah. that, the miniature rooms have a purely honest aesthetic to them. And, mm -hmm. and what I mean by that is that all the rest of the art in the gallery and in the show is created from a point of view. It's created to give a message. And um, the miniature rooms are not that at all. They, the miniature rooms are done. It's an honest depiction of, of what we think a room might have looked like through research and through history. And when the viewer looks at those, they're not getting a message. They are placing themselves into the room. And so they just add this really kind of wonderful um, other element to this show and they are curious you know they're yeah. curious because of because people are, are amazed by how they're made and for sure. And they are absolutely beautiful rooms. And Jay Kupchak, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you for being involved in this show and having your work presented. I mean, I think for us, for us, the miniatures enthusiasts, this is a rare opportunity to get to chat with you and to get to see you and, and have you talk about your work all in one time. So head exploding. Tell us if, if for, for the four, for the one or two people who don't know who you are, tell mm -hmm. us who you are. Tell us a little bit about you and your iconic family and talk a little bit about your, a little bit about your miniatures, because I have a million questions. <laughs> well, um, uh, my dad started working in the early thirties for Narcissa Thorne and the uh, European series was already finished. And I think there were 33 rooms and she was just starting her American series. And uh, she'd been touring and Life Magazine had done an article on her. And my dad was working for a company called uh, Allied Radio. And radio was everything in those days. They were like the Apple store of their time. Right. It was doing their window displays. They had a store on Michigan Avenue. And he saw this article and Thorne talked about how she couldn't get miniature glass and she couldn't get miniature cane work done and uh, plexiglass had just been invented. Oh. And because Allied Radio was a cutting edge company, they used plexiglass. That was the new thing. And he had access to it. So he made some little uh, goblets and a little footstool that he came to the uh, top of, sent them to Thorn. Yeah. <laughs> and she, her secretary called him up a few days yeah. later and asked him to come in to, to meet her. Yeah. She asked him how, she, how he did the things and he told her and she hired him on the spot. Wow, wow. He ended up working for Thorn for about three years and they did the other, I guess there were 34 rooms that they did in three years, which was pretty fast. Yeah, yeah. So so did you, this was all before you were born, right? Had to have been a bit before I was born, yes. So, so when you were growing up, obviously you knew his participation, you know, his con contributions to the rooms. At what point did you get involved in making miniatures yourself? And it was you and your brother too, right? Who yes, yes. Got both active. Of at what oh, point did you say, this is what I want to do? <laughs> well, um, oh, we would go to his shop and we'd play around. And, you know, my grade school was a block away from his shop. So I'd go over there in the afternoon and, oh, I'd turn things on the lathe, make a little handle yeah. for stuff. Um, 
And we didn't, and Hank and I really didn't do that much when we were teenagers, mm -hmm. a little bit. Mm -hmm. Later on, um, while we were both in college, we did a little work and all of a sudden we kind of found ourselves doing it in the early 70s. We hadn't really planned on it. Hank was an going after an architecture degree and I was getting an engineering and art degree. Right. And you know, who wants to work in a family business really? But So had your dad been still making miniatures the whole time when you were growing up? And working in his studio, was he a working artist? Well, yes and no. He, the, uh, the Thorn Rooms were finished by, I think it was 34 or 35, 1934. And he continued to do some work for Thorn. His younger cousin, um, Lee Meisinger, she did all the petty point carpets for all of the thorn rooms. Mm -hmm. Then she ended up being in charge of the rooms as they toured. Mm -hmm. And they would go from place to place. And as um, your enthusiasts know, all yeah. of the objects in the thorn rooms are loose. Right. So every time they got moved, yeah. I believe they had three or four box cars full of stuff. Oh my gosh. Move those rooms. And they would get to a new city and they would you know, move the crates to the museum or wherever they're being shown. And they would take all of the stuff out for each room and place right. it, you know, in the room. And then she'd stay for a while. And she did that for a couple of years. And my dad still participated because even though Thorne was done with her major room, she still liked to make things and she and a number of the other Chicago socialites right. produced stuff for um, an organization called the Women's Exchange. Yep, right. Which right. you probably know about. And they supported Children's Memorial Hospital. And a lot of things were sold through the Women's Exchange. Beautiful. Small things. Right. Um, so, so a lot of this learning happened through osmosis or you did, you were in the studio, you, you know, did, 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 um, did your dad sit you down and say, these are some of the tips and tricks? I mean, did, how did you, what did, what, what, what were the greatest learnings you learned from him oh. that impacted some of the, some of the rooms that we're going to see today? <laughs> well, I might, no, he didn't really that. sit us down and teach us anything. <laughs> right. Um, you know, my brother was uh, an accomplished draftsman, so he would do drawings of, of new rooms. Mm -hmm. um, my dad didn't really want to spend a whole lot of time drawing something up, so, you know, he would draw something on brown paper. He didn't care. Right. And it was just enough so he knew what he was doing. And Hank would do more comprehensive drawings. Right. So right. the quality of the drawings improved in right. the 70s. And it was, I started out doing um, glass display cases when I was like 16. They were sold at Marshall Field and Abercrombie and Fitch of all places. And I did that for a while. Then later on in the early 70s, he had started a number of lines of miniature objects, miniature silver pieces, right, right. miniature French gilt pieces, miniature Fabergé pieces. And I did all the enameling and assembly of the Fabergé pieces. Um, I kind of started out doing that. And it was kind of a level of expectation. I mean, either you could do it or you couldn't. Yeah. Um, you know, if you were ham-handed and you couldn't <sighs> handle a miniature, well, then, you know, you did something else. Right. Um, we were capable. Right. Right. So tell us about the Cupjack Studios. Now, this is where most of the room boxes from, from the Cupjacks are housed. Isn't is that still around? Do we still have the Cupjack Studios? Is it a place that we can visit? Well, at, at the moment, I'm, I'm moving the studio. Uh -huh. But there's still, I think, altogether, there's probably close to 50 rooms in the collection right now. That's amazing. Um, that's Victor amazing. has a couple down here. Yeah. Yeah. Spread around a little bit. 
So, so tell us a little bit about some of the room boxes that are in this exhibition and we're going to get a walkthrough, right? Yes. You tell so me when. Why don't, do why don't we do a, a walkthrough of the exhibition and then let's get down to seeing the room boxes because it'll help us figure out how the room boxes fit within this. Um, Should we do sure. that now? Yes. Curiosities. Yeah. Walk let's around. do that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. It'll be and fun. I'm going to yeah. try. Tell sure. me if I'm moving too quickly and I, I will. will. Uh, bring so this far, so good. Yeah. Oh, yeah, look. Oh, that's okay. So yeah. this is the uh, the exhibition, and you can see there is quite a mix. We've created <laughs> truly a wonder comer. And I'm just going to hold the camera up to some of these objects as I walk around. Mm -hmm. The show includes paintings. Mm -hmm. It includes sculptures. There are five main artists in the exhibition. I think uh, in total, there's well over 30 artists whose work is being shown because as we were putting this together, I wanted to create just uh, a real mix of things. So you have Memento More, you have found object art, you have fine uh, paintings and drawings, you have sculpture, um, one of the main artists in this show, mm -hmm. let's see, and we'll come back to a lot of these rooms. I'm just kind of showing you. One of the main artists in this show is um, on this wall here. We kind of did a recreation of his studio. This is Marcos Raya, who is located in Pilsen here in Chicago and one of, was one of the original muralist artists on the south side hmm. and um, did a type of art and does a type of art for much of his career called resquache art, which means someone who just creates art from anything that's around them. Oh, wow. Using wow. regular materials to sort of be a creator. That's awesome. Yeah. That is really some awesome stuff. Wow. And then, so Marcos Raya is a very uh, well-known artist here in Chicago. He's in the collection of the, the um, MCA here in the city, the Museum of Contemporary Art. Mm -hmm. uh, he's been around forever. He's in his 70s now. Mm -hmm. um, this is kind of a homage to Frida Kahlo that was oh. arranged exactly as he had this in his studio when I first visited him. Here's a little picture of his studio. And this oh, is wow. the recreation we did on in his show here. So it was looking at art like this that really inspired the show and the, the ability that I had to go to their studios and kind of be amazed. This is another artist named Rick Farrell who works with all found object mm -hmm. art. These are found and collected objects that he places together using yeah. wire, sometimes glue, but mostly wire. Yeah. You know, you, you know, you definitely see the influence of miniatures and small scale things, yes. which, um, which, you know, seems to be a reoccurring theme, you know, which is nice. Then here's a literal cabinet of curiosities. It's a oh. hard steel cabinet that we have, and it's just filled with all sorts of things. The, awesome. um, another of the artists who's featured here is John Soybert, who uses these old clock parts. So you'll hear those cuckoo clocks again. Yes. Are, some are weight driven, some are um, wind up, and they're placed throughout the space as well. Beautiful. Beautiful. So that's the idea behind the show. Um, yeah, it, it looks like you could spend days in there just it, looking at all of the it, wonderful objects. It, and it's them. one of the great things of this show. People usually for an art show will come in in five minutes or 10 yeah. minutes at the most and they're gone. People yeah. are here for an hour or more and then Easily. they Easily, yeah. because you can't take it all in. You have to stop and, and, yeah. and take it in and see every object. That's a, it's a lot, it's, it's a lot. So, wow. and then you've got the miniature rooms, which then we've got these, <laughs> which, which adds a whole nother element. So, all right. So what, what is the first one that we're looking at? Okay. This, I'm going to let Jay take over from here. This is okay. a 17th century 
pirate captain's cabin circa 1680. Oh my God. Created about 2008. And Jay, if you could just walk over sure, there, maybe sure. you'll get in the frame. And there it is. <clears throat> I'll go in a little closer so you can see. So, Sorry about the reflections. <clears throat> but so that was made what year? 2008? Circa 2008. So 2008, so it's a relatively new box. Yes. Wow. All right. So tell, I mean, let's ask a question. There's so much happening in there. I mean, I guess, I mean, I, I'll open the chat box for questions, but so Jay, every object in there is handmade, correct? Every object is handmade by, uh, everything is made by us. Yes. By you guys. And, mm -hmm. and do you, but do you, the, how long did it take to make this box? And I'm, I would love to know how, mm -hmm. I, I can't oh, even speak. <laughs> it was probably made over about a year year a year and and, and what is the case yeah. probably took almost as long as the inside and that's what i was going to ask you about because i mean i'd love to get to the miniatures but that case is beautiful too what tell a lot us a hammering <laughs> what's that a lot of hammering a lot of so it's is it is it um is individual it little wood with yeah. hand hammered uh rivets is that what that out what the way what well, they they're are? all all decorative yeah you could call them rivets you know they're they use them for chair upholstery, you name it. So it's so a just, it's a combination of different, basically upholstery nails. Actually, upholstery. Well, uh, Denise wants to know the source for the inspiration for the box. So, I mean, yeah, we're all stuck on that box because it's so beautiful. You know, why do a pirate ship? No, what's oh, so that's it's a tr it's a pirate trunk. Is that what it is? Well, the trunk is you know pretty decorative for you know. For pirates, yeah, generally didn't spend as much effort on a trunk, but you know it's a fancy trunk because it's a fancy room, right? It's a very fancy room. It's very fancy. It's lovely. It's just beautiful. So okay, I'm, I'm uh, really wonderful. Should we take one more question about that room before we move on? Is there a story behind the scene? So it is a, a moment in time. Well, we had we were trying to do rooms that were a little more theatrical. Mm -hmm. And um, we had had a design to do the captain's cabin of the Constitution. Mm. And we thought, well, you know, that's a nice interior. And it's a nice ship, but it's pretty austere. Mm -hmm. So who wouldn't like the captain's cabin of a pirate ship? I mean, look at all that booty. <laughs> yeah. That's what it's about. It's bling. Yeah. 16th or 17th century bling. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, it was a short period where, where pirates were able to do their thing. And this was kind of about as good as it got. Yeah. No, for them. Sure. Yeah. You know, one of the things that make your room so incredible is um, has a lot to do with how you play with light and how you play with depth and dimension and light. Um, and it looks very specific. There's that whole row of, I don't know, are those, those can't be ship portals are they what what are well, the that's the rear windows at the back of the ship oh that is incredible the captain's cabin is oh so we're actually looking at it the thin like the thin way oh my goodness yes you're you're I in the back of the ship now. and you're looking out the back end yeah i mean i was trying to think of wow this is a really wide room for a ship but now i get it it's all the I don't know how to say it, but it's all the thin, the thin ver visual of the ship. Well, you know, it's only about 11 or 12 feet wide. It's not that wide. Uh -huh, uh -huh. You know, these weren't gigantic ships. Mm -hmm. They seem to be big, but they really weren't that big. Right. Compared well, to like a Spanish galleon, uh -huh. which well, they the like to sink. <laughs> this perspective is awesome. It just is. Well, it's a fun room and uh, everybody likes it. And yeah, you know, it's not just for adults. Right, right. Well, we can spend days on that. Um, is there another room we can see? Yeah. Sure. So, and Darren, I just wanted to add that the rooms that we're showing in the show, we chose because they had cases built. So like the pirate ship and like right. the uh, charter house we're going to see right now. Um, but a lot of the rooms are meant to be buried into a wall. And we mm -hmm. thought for the first show, we would want to make it so that a collector or somebody who was interested in purchasing one could see that possibility as just a counterpiece. This is Medieval French Charter House li Library. 
Normandy, France, circa 1425. I mean, this, this just, I, it got, this got so much response when I posted it on my Instagram. It's just incredible. All right. So tell us about this piece. With an operating fireplace. Oh no, <laughs> get out. Well. Um, and illuminated manuscripts. Just What, what year is this? What year did you do this? Oh, you mean what year was it created? Yes, please. Oh, geez. So I have to look on the thing myself. <laughs> I don't well, think it's on there, that one. We didn't have the date on there. It's probably 10, 12 years old. Okay. Okay. Something like that. Yep. Um, and I love how it's. Of a, of a group that was made that were smaller and easier to display. It's meant to go on a shelf. I mean, you can see the. The faux books. I love the faux books. So what's what's your favorite part of the process as a miniaturist? What do you love? Because, I mean, there's so much involved here from making an individual piece to making a box to designing to finding the tools and materials. What is your favorite part of the process? Well, it's always showing the room to somebody who's seeing it for the first time. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean... Um, I'm pushing 70. I've been seeing this stuff since I was a little kid. Uh, so right. I'm not really that impressed anymore. <laughs> but first timers, you know, it, it, it's, it's fun to see a first time. Yeah. Or even sure. somebody who is familiar with things and, you know, they get to be a little kid kind of. And so that's, that's probably the most fun part. And the what do you think? Is just work. What do you think is the greatest appeal to, for miniatures? I mean, what why do is, people like them? Yeah, why do people love them so much? Well, I mean, you can look at the classic reasons. Um, mm -hmm. You have your uh, somebody who builds a dollhouse for themselves. And the dollhouse is the house that they can't have as a full-size house because they have a family who destroys the big house. <laughs> right. So they make the little house for themselves and it's exactly what they want. Uh -huh. And they can suspend their disbelief and pretend that that's where they live right. and not in the total train wreck that is their life. They right. can escape from it. <laughs> right. I mean, that's you, really the appeal. Do, do you I, really not and get impressed by miniatures anymore? I mean, is, I mean, are you, are you tapped into the miniatures world at all? Or you're just, you're over it. You don't follow any artists or do you, and who are they and what impresses you? Well, we never really followed any specific artists because there were no miniature artists when my dad started. And there really weren't that many when Hank and I started right. in the seventies. I mean, there were some, but not too many. Yeah. There are some, we've run across a number of people that we really do like over the years. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't have any names to give you necessarily, but there was a museum that was um, LA, um, a miniature museum in Los Angeles that was owned and run by the uh, K's. Right. You might be familiar with them. Yes. And they had a pretty good cross section of people doing work at the time. Mm -hmm. And um, there was a guy who did the seven deadly sins okay. as a display. And I believe there were seven different rooms. And oh, wow. those were very interesting. They were a little different, but yeah. we liked those. Yeah, yeah. And there was another guy who did dolls. And they were, I think, 18-inch dolls. And he was a very interesting guy. Mm -hmm. I'm... I, can only imagine that I think he had some conversations with these dolls. <laughs> no, as, as some people do. Some people do. No judgments. And they were they were really fabulous dolls, and they had a certain kind of creep factor to them. Right, right. Which right. I won't elaborate on, but anybody who has dolls will yeah. know what I'm talking about. For sure, for sure. Not Chucky, but you know. <laughs> So this is the this is um this is the Roman tent we're looking at. Which one is this? this? Alexander's siege tent, Heliconarsis, circa three thirty three B.C. Oh my goodness! Hey, he was out in the Syrian desert. So th these are what these are um uh, are generals' tents when they're at war. Tell us about what this set no, it up. This is Alexander's tent. 
his this tent. Is, this is his tent. This is half of his tent. But but they had these set up during war, right? Am I right on that? Well, he was on his campaign conquering uh-huh. the world. He had to stay somewhere. So tell us Ow. about some of these beautiful objects in this tent. So I see an amazing headdress. Well, these there's quite a bit of information about um, you know how how the Greeks dressed. You yes. know their uh, information about their war machines. A lot of it came from. Um, you know, uh, vase paintings, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. the Etruscan stuff, mm. which was the Tupperware of its era. They were all, they were just throwaways, all this Etruscan stuff. Of course, it's extremely valuable now. Yeah. But at the time, it was just a clay pot. Right. So there's quite a bit of information about, you know, Alexander, not so much drawings of his stuff. Mm. So, you know, Hank kind of imagined some of it and, yeah. you know, went through the historical record. And it's it's not an exact copy of something that did exist, but it certainly could have existed. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about some of the materials that you use? Are, you know, I'm, I'm looking at lamps. I don't know. Uh, they look like iron. Is everything in there? What are the materials that he used to make some of these pieces? I see a candelabra. I don't know if it's a candelabra, the tall piece. Well, anything that's small and highly detailed and we needed more than one of is metal. They're metal. They're metal. Some of the objects are bronze and they're gold plated. Others we would cast in lead because they it was easier and a little cheaper. Right. Um, all of the all of the little uh, fittings that actually go on these posts that make the tent itself. Mm-hmm. That was something that the Romans did later on, and they stole from the Greeks uh-huh. whatever they wanted to. Yeah. Um, so it's it's a design that is consistent with what could exist. There's oil lamps. Yes, that's what um, it is, an oil lamp I was looking at. On his desk, you can see some models of some siege machines that they built. Yeah. And models were used then. I mean, most of these people who built the stuff were... They were certainly illiterate and making a model of something, they could copy the model. You right. know, that was easy. Yeah. Um, so, I, you know, it's kind of everything he would wear and, you know, yeah. his weapons and you name it. Which way? Yeah. Oh. I'm just loving how the light is coming through the tent. And that just. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's hot perfect, in the desert. Perfect right. example of using the light to, um, to really create that illusion. Uh, awesome. All right. So, Oh, this is one of my favorite rooms. Jay, can you read oh, the description? On the yes, side? This, the this is your classic, um, um, not so much provincial, but um, what would you call it? Um, you know, American design. Yeah. And they borrowed from the English, but this was, this was a, a colonial America. And this was a room, a Hudson Valley room in Boston. Oh, beautiful. And, and you can see there's furniture that was built here in Boston, um, ceramic pieces that either, most of them were probably Chinese import. Mm-hmm. Um, there were silversmiths in, in, you know, in this country at the time. Right. Um, the light fixtures were most likely made here. Mm-hmm. Some of the ironwork was imported. And this could be right before the revolution. Mm-hmm. So a lot of the things were English imports because they wouldn't allow necessarily things to be made in, the, in America, in the colonies. Right. right. They right. buy them from Europe, from England. Awesome. Again, um, the use of light and having the windows off to the side with having light coming through, it just, these are just wonderful ways to bring life to these room boxes and to make well, it feel real. We practice the two to three sun design. Oh, what does that mean? That means that you have the sun coming in two opposite windows, which is impossible. Oh. How would you get light in two windows on two sides, opposite sides of a room? So uh, is that, is that, so that's really interesting. So you would play with that in the illusion. You would have sun coming in from both directions. Well, exactly. Sometimes three directions. Three Sometimes directions. Sometimes four directions. 
And that would never happen in real life? I guess not. It you can't. It's pretty tricky. <laughs> you tell well, me. That, I was going to ask you about some of the secrets, things that people don't know about the secrets to making these wonderful rooms. And I think that's just one of them right there that I did never thought about. <laughs> Are well, there other tricks you know. that people might not know? I heard in an interview of yours that all tricks. Not, not everything opens. Not nothing opens. opens. Nothing opens. <laughs> well, we're behind glass and we don't make um, pieces, you know, separate pieces. And that's uh-huh. one of the issues with miniatures is it's very difficult to make a functional piece mm-hmm. that looks real because the the tolerance, like you make a little drawer that opens, uh-huh. it's very really hard to make the tolerance is so tight that it right? looks real. Yes. And, oh. and so is that one of the reasons why they're so perfectly scaled is because that fraction of a fraction of an inch that you don't have a separation between a drawer that opens. It, it, or a cabinet door that opens. Yeah. What's that? Well, a cabinet door that opens. None of these doors. But not are having open. that extra slice in the wood, the space between the cabinet door and the cabinet. If you don't have that, then you don't have that extra space. So the scaling is kind of perfect at that point. Do you know what I mean? Well, I, that's how I see it. It's more realistic. It's more realistic. And it's the same thing with, say, a chair or mm-hmm. a table with, say, a cabrio leg. Mm-hmm. To make a leg the right proportions to look correct, it gets pretty delicate and it's hard to handle. Mm-hmm. So if you're, say, doing stuff for a dollhouse mm-hmm. that's going to be handled, you make everything a little heavier. Uh-huh. But since all our stuff is not meant to be handled, we can make it the correct proportion interesting that you know would be a little too delicate right be handled you you could break it easily right so that's a trick i guess no for sure for sure it, you know the 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 scaling is unmatched in almost any anywhere <laughs> well it's not it's not that hard to do the scaling anybody can do it we we're not but it's not done uh, we're not magicians, so to speak, or superhuman or anything. No, um, but that answers some. They of are that. superhuman magicians. They, they are superhuman. Put that out there. <laughs> no, but to your point, you know, you're not going to make something if it's getting used and held if it's going to break. So that is something to think about. But yeah, and if you can't see it out the window, it's not there. The scene ends. Mm-hmm. Right. So right. you think there's a scene out there. You can imagine a scene, but if you can't see it out the window, it's not there. Same thing through a door. If you can't see it, it's not there. There is no room behind there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, why put it? It's, it's crazy to put it in there. All right, let's talk about this room. What is this one? Which is this piece? This is an 18th century New England cartographer. Oh, I just love the captain's chair. Is it the the little black captain's chair? Is my, oh my gosh, it's fabulous. Well, this guy was probably he could have been a seafarer, mm-hmm. possibly. He certainly knew a lot of captains because you come to get your charts from him. Oh, look at that! Just beautiful. And he had his telescope. He could see who's coming in mm-hmm. the harbor, and you know. Um, it could have been a retired captain who decided that he wanted to you know, keep his hand in and he had personal experience of going to these various places and had insights to lend that mm-hmm. you couldn't necessarily put on the, the map itself. They tried to put a lot of information on, but yeah. there's nothing like talking to the guy who actually sailed mm-hmm. in that area. Is, is that box only backlit? No, this one has the outside scene is lit. Yep. There's light coming through the windows. Then we we put little lights up in the up in the ceiling mm-hmm. to light. The, otherwise, the desk would be so dark. Right. Right. That's, that's, that's always the hardest part. How much light do you add? Right. Right. But but there but you have to have some light. Into your point, you gotta have something. Yes. You gotta have light. Well, that's beautiful. Okay. 
Awesome. Let's see if we got a question while we move on to the next one. Superpower. Oh, Cindy, Cindy is agrees that, yep, you have superpower magicians. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, sure we yes. do. Allegra wants, thank you, Cindy. <laughs> Allegra wants to know, do you have room boxes? Do all of your room boxes have a backstory about who might live in them? Do you always have a story? Well, I mean, yes and no, kind of a generic person or, I mean, yeah. not so much unless it's an actual copy of something that existed and you can attach a person to it, something right. historical. Right. Um, my dad did uh, um, the house that Washington stayed at in Valley Forge. Mm -hmm. And that's very specific. You know, it's Washington. There's his coat and his hat and his dispatch case. And, right. you know, that you can connect to Washington. Yeah. But, I mean, some of the other things you don't have to necessarily connected to a real existing person right right that's for the viewer they can pretend it's them right. they live in the place yeah for sure sure so we did hear some um late breaking news that there were a couple of more room boxes that have been acquired recently into the gallery or brought into the gallery um a thorn room uh and yeah. another yeah. Yes, so the uh, Jay can tell you, but uh, we just received uh, last week two mm. additional rooms that had been lent to the Art Institute since 2009. One of them was an original Narcissa Niblack Thorne room she created in 1934. It was wow. supposed to be in the collection at the Art Institute. When they built the rooms, they needed a broom closet, and so they pulled this room out and Narcissa used it for parts, as they say, right? Well, she she, yeah. she had an issue, or actually the Art Institute had an issue with her. Now, this was the 30s. And Thorne was what you would call a force of nature. Uh -huh. I'll bet. She had a ton of money and had no problem spending it. In fact, she was the only supporter of the Art Institute for a number of years during the Depression. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Originally, she wanted the Institute to build full-size period rooms. Full-size. Oh. You can imagine the pushback she got on that. It was a lot of room, very expensive, and the bottom line was who cares? <laughs> But wasn't the original intention of the Thorn Rooms was, was because she wanted to educate the masses about interiors throughout history. And she couldn't do it. She couldn't bring big size rooms everywhere. So she created the smaller versions. Well, is, yes, is that yes. sort of how it came about? The Art Institute told her that there was no way they were going to build full size rooms. They built one, just one. And so, okay, she said, well, I'll do what the theater people do. I'll build maquettes. Mm -hmm. And if you're familiar with what a maquette is, those are the, the designs that the stage designer does for mm -hmm. a theatrical production. And they're miniatures. Right. So she just went a couple of steps, added a couple of zeros to that and made it real interiors. Wow. That way she could do her 67 interiors and put them in a small gallery. Well, the powers that be, the director at the time, didn't like that either. <laughs> so she basically got what she wanted. She got her, she built the rooms, she got her gallery built, she got them all installed. And the director took a shot at her. Mm -hmm. He came down for the decree, well, we need a broom closet in the gallery. So take a room, pick a room to come out, which was pretty insulting. <laughs> Did I mean, they ever believe that it would be as popular as it is today? Because it is one of the main attractions for the Institute, for the Art Institute. Did they think, or they were just appeasing her at the time, or did they really believe that they that this room was going to attract so much attention? What do you think? They indulged her because she was a multimillionaire and she supported the arts. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, that, mm -hmm. That's really what it was. Up until about 10 years ago, when they got a new director who came from a publishing background. Hmm. First thing he did was he did a survey of people who came to the Institute, why they came there and what they came to see. 
And I'm not telling any secrets, I don't think, but the bottom line was 40% of the people who come to the Art Institute come to see the miniature rooms. There you go. I They'll love go it. see the other stuff too. Right. That's the number reason. Yeah, yeah. Now the I Art know. Institute didn't make this public. What they did instead was they said, well, there's three reasons people come to the Art Institute. There's the Monet's, there's the permanent collection, and there's the miniature rooms. They didn't say which ones were the most popular. Right. But basically 40% of the people who go there go to see the rooms which is the difference between them being successful and being bankrupt. Wow. That's just awesome. I mean, that's a much. great inside story. I love it. I love it. 70 so I don't, years yeah. in the basement, no, um, no advertising, no promotion, no nothing. Yeah. 70 years. Yeah. yeah. People yeah. still come once or twice a year. They still do. That's For their entire happy. lives. Absolutely. So you tell so, me. So I don't think we're going to get a chance to see them, but the good news is they will be installed at some point. And for folks who are on right now, many of whom are going to be in Chicago for the Tom Bishop show may get a chance to come and see the Thorn Room that when you have it placed in the gallery, right, Victor? Yes, we are having them built uh, to be installed in the gallery. I don't know what your time is, but- uh, It's we the can. last weekend of April. April. I mean, what's your timing is left if we should go? Oh, and kind of um, we have a few minutes. Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay, let's go back. Let's go crazy. You, might as, yes. you might as well see an original thorn room while you're here. <laughs> for sure. For sure. Created yes. in 1934. This, there are two rooms that we received from the Art Institute. This is a Pullman car, which is really quite extraordinary. It's at an angle. And yes. from the car, you can also see the rooms at the station out the side windows, which is really hard to depict, I think, even from here. But that's that really must be seen in person. This yes. is one of the original Thorn Rooms. Oh, my goodness. Yes, yes, it's yes. probably the most elaborate hallway she could find. Oh, my gosh. And, and it was probably tough for her to decide which one to pull out. And the wow. furniture she used in some of her other little projects. And the room was dismantled sitting in her studio. Yeah. And she passed away in, in early 60s, I think it was 64. Yeah. And she gave the contents of her studio to my dad and they included this room. That's a real tiny room box for, for by the Thorn Room standards. It is. It it's is. It's probably the smallest show. room. <laughs> Oh, and then here's some furniture. Here's some of the furniture that's yet to be placed in this little box. Oh, you get out. Oh, here. <laughs> oh, Let's here. Show them the clock. Let's see the clock. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, we got it in pieces. It sat for years. Oh. Finally, we put it back. There's the little clock. Oh, there it is. There's the clock. Is that a carved clock. It's oh, a carved man. clock. It was carved by Mr. Weber. Who's and that? he carved all of the um. No, you see a little bit better. He, or, or there's a TV. Or there yeah. is. He carved all of the intaglio blocks, which oh. were used to do all of the applied decoration in all the rooms. And he did this clock as well. He carved a few things. And this is about as good as a carving can be in miniature. For sure. Um, and, and it's still, you can, oh, here. It's still a little rough, but, you know, it looks pretty good. Yeah. Here's a, here's a chair. Is it upholstered or is that? It has fabric on it, but there's no upholstery. There's no padding. What are you, crazy? <laughs> Isn't and that good? goes back to the scaling. That's Nobody's going to sit on it. That's the trick. That's not a trick. It's crazy <laughs> to put the padding. I mean, you can do it if you want, but. Right. But it adds, you know. it adds bulk to it that you don't need. Well, it, 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 it looks, it, 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 it's hard to make it look right. Anything that makes it harder to look right, we get rid of. Right, you know, right. If it's not necessary, why do it? Yeah. I mean, you, if, you're making, if you're making a miniature of something like a, uh, something that's going to be functional, mm -hmm. and part of the thing is that it's functional yeah. as a miniature. Well, that's different. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But if you're making stuff to look at, 
And, and I mean, that's the biggest difference. And and well, how would you describe the 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 constant pull and give and pull from art versus craft in the miniatures world? Because we constantly hear, oh, that's not art, because it's miniature or whatever, it's toy, it's it's dollhouse. Have you have you battled that? And how do you respond to that? Oh, we battle it constantly, and it's decorative arts decorative against arts. fine art. Ah, ah. That's always how it's been. Ah. And decorative art is more or less described as functional. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, a chair you sit on, um, you know, um, a bureau plaque, whatever. That's usable mm -hmm. decorative art. So you would put room box under decorative art? I mean, I would. The, the <laughs> easiest way to describe it from our point of view is super realistic, three dimensional um, still lives. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Still life. So yeah. you get in front of it and you're looking at it. You don't move your head. It's a painting. Right. You move your head around, you get different views. It's still a painting, but it's different views. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but it's a three-dimensional still life i love it i love that that's awesome but we've battled it forever yeah yeah you know trying to be legitimate so to speak right so are you still making miniatures where are you at what's you know do you oh do you, yeah you know yeah. <laughs> what else am i gonna do victor <laughs> needs something to show now I, right. I have an overlord <laughs> but you say that the studio is in transition, but there may be a time when we could have visit. Yes, there will be a time where you can visit again. And I'm, I'm working on doing a series with someone I can't tell you anything about yet. Okay. okay. That will be a little more public. And there's any number of, you, you know, miniature people, they have a hundred things in their head they'd like to make. That's right. I'm no different. <laughs> right you know there's a lot of stuff to make yeah. you want to hear about one thing yeah <laughs> oh, okay well i'd like to do you know you know the arabian nights alibaba and the 40 thieves yeah i'd like to do his cave oh that would be awesome that would you know, be all his stuff that he's been stealing that's great and i think that would be fun yeah for sure for sure maybe the uh the submarine from jules verne that'd be a fun one yeah. There's a lot of fun stuff. A lot do. of fun stuff. And there's oh. a lot of fun stuff in this exhibit. I'm so excited. I wish I can get down there to see it. So WonderCom is going to be around until the end of March. Till March 30, 31st, yeah. And then at any some point after that, we can come see the new Thorn Room that's new. And But where will these boxes go? Where will the Cupjack pieces go? They will remain here. Okay. And they so will remain. So if we're actually continuing the exhibition of the cut jack rooms, not in the format that we have them now where they're intermixed, they're gonna be set aside a little bit more of an austere installation. Beautiful. Uh, and then we're gonna talk about bringing more in. Uh, we're going to build in some walls to house the rooms that need to be placed inside. And uh, we actually have Expo Chicago coming in April to mm -hmm. the city, which is a big art fair. So a lot of people will come in. We yeah. have a, a totally different show coming up next, but the rooms will continue to be shown Beautiful. and some of them will become permanent installations as well. Beautiful. And I continue so, working So we plopped in your Instagram account, your um, website, so people can follow you now, find out what's going on. I know I'm gonna try to get myself to come and see it. I cannot thank you guys enough for sharing the exhibition. Um, Jay and sharing all your knowledge and sharing these beautiful room boxes. Thank you so much, both of you. This has been such an awesome treat and a really rare opportunity to, to see, you know, these iconic pieces in, 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 uh, in this live stream. Thank you so much. Maybe we thank can do you. it again. Yes. Uh, that you. would be awesome. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank, you. thank you guys at home for watching. I appreciate it. Join us back on Saturday and Sunday for no live for more live streams. And once again, thank you guys for, for joining us today. This has just been awesome. You guys have a great night. Thank you so much. <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> See you later. <laughs> All right. Bye guys. Thank you.